Hello everybody and welcome. Good afternoon Facebook fans. We are live from the Facebook offices in central London on International Women's Day. It's got to be your story. It's got to be how you personally can make a difference. The smallest gesture goes such a long way. We are putting the movement in your hands, turning to you to help us create a world in which gender is just a spectrum of beauty and not limitation. We're committed to increasing the representation of women all across the company, all across the globe, in both technology positions and also in leadership positions. Women actually not only contribute in terms of participating in the labor force, they drive entrepreneurship. peace in the world and 50% of the world is women and they're not included in the same conversation. It's actually my letter to her. It's so he for she. Okay, that's amazing. Yo, it's Lynn and I have to laugh. How can we need not be equal? We're like half. Like women are like half of the people on earth. And yes, they should have been uh, equal since birth. We believe that students should leave university believing in, striving for, and expecting societies of true equality. And part of this liberation movement requires that we call out and break down these social norms and barriers to our well-being so that we may all be free to be our true selves. There's power in embracing everything we feel. These traits don't make us a man or a woman. They make us human. Thank you. Okay, welcome, welcome, Elizabeth. So I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Yamayaro to Namely in our community tonight. Um, we're so pleased to have you here. And I'm going to start with just a short story to let you know how I personally got to know Elizabeth, and then we are going to get into it because there is so much to talk about and Elizabeth has so much to share that's really, really powerful. And I hope for tonight, we all feel that we can leave this discussion with something that we do different tomorrow to make a difference. So Elizabeth and I encountered each other a few years ago, actually more than a few years ago, when the he for she movement was really at that point just an idea. And I don't have the depth of story that Elizabeth has, but I'll tell you how I was involved. We got to meet each other because when the he for she movement was launched, the software company I was working for, we decided to donate our software to help the uh, initiative get launched. Elizabeth was the leader um, who was driving the actual strategy and um, kickoff of the program. And one of my top customers at the time was the biggest sponsor, PwC, of the He For She movement. So Elizabeth, myself, and PwC, we found ourselves getting to know each other quite well and getting ready for that launch and then getting as many people involved that we can with that launch. And the program is so important and in some ways unique in speaking on behalf and only on behalf, because the amazing women at Namely are the women who started the Women in Employee Resource Group here, lead it, nurture it, cultivate it every single day with, of course, their male colleagues who participate and the amazing support of our CEO, Larry Donovan. And the thing about he for she that's so important is that it taps into and asks the other half of the population that we need to create equality to participate. And women can't do it alone. And that's what he for she was all founded on. 
So with that background, I actually want to start with having this group of people get to know Elizabeth a little bit, because if you know her background, you'll better understand the passion and the energy that she brings, not only for he for she, but her role at the UN and other pretty amazing things that you do on a daily basis. So Elizabeth, my first question to you is more about Elizabeth the person. And you grew up in Zimbabwe, and you have a background that is pretty unique from most, I think, of the people in this room and on the webcast. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you grew up in those early years and the day that you met your first woman in blue? Yes, thank you so much, Elisa, and thank you everyone for being here today. So when I was eight years old, something incredible happened to me in a moment of utter devastation. I was living in a small village in Zimbabwe with my grandmother who was raising me, and we grew up with very little. You know, life in the community was very basic. You know, we lived off our land, and we did well, though, as a community until the drought came when I was eight years old. And literally, our rivers dried up, the crops died, our cattle perished, and we went without food for several days. And one day, I was lying underneath a tree and I could barely move. And at that moment, I actually thought, this is the end of my life. And I was saying a prayer, you know, sort of thinking that this is it. And all of a sudden, this woman emerged out of nowhere, literally. And she was wearing a blue uniform. And she gave me a bowl of warm porridge. And she saved my life. I didn't know who this woman was. I didn't know where she came from. She was another African woman, but not from my village. And it was only after two years later when we had another drought and we ended up having to flee my village. My grandmother sort of asked me to leave so that, you know, I could survive. And I ended up in the city for the first time and I ended up in school for the very, very first time. And it was during this moment that I realized that this woman who had saved my life at the age of eight actually worked for the United Nations. And it became my dream from that moment that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be like her. Because one of the things that, that she said to me, you know, in a very sort of childish innocence, I said to her, why are you here? This was after I sort of recovered myself. And she said, I'm here because as Africans, we have to uplift each other. Of course, those words meant nothing at the time. But right. as I reflected at the age of 10, I thought, aha, that's what I have to do. I have to be like her, I have to work for the United Nations, I have to uplift the lives of others. And that's really how I got to where I am. So it's inspiring in so many ways, but I think my biggest takeaway from it is everything that we try to tell our children, particularly our daughters and what they can do, is true. You can do anything you want. You went from literally thinking you wouldn't survive to now a leading national leader, a global leader as a part of the UN. So it's just awesome to hear your story. Now there's another part of your story that I think is really worth telling, which is the day you discovered inequality existed. Because as I understand your story, you never really thought about inequality. You were a part of a village, that village worked to survive and you all worked together and then you left that village and something happened. Tell that part of your story to us. Yes, and so in this moment of devastation, again, being torn away from my grandmother, my village, the only people that I knew, to be living with this aunt who I'd never met before, uh, but then that also gave me an opportunity to go to school. I was 10 years old. I ended up at this sort of British school. I couldn't read. I couldn't write my name, I couldn't speak English, and everything was taught in English. And all of a sudden, this whole new reality emerged in front of me, and for the first time I thought, oh, there's something different about me because of the way the other kids looked at me, right? I was the girl from the countryside, the girl who couldn't read, the girl who couldn't write, and all of a sudden, I was confronted with three levels of inequality all at the same time from having known no inequality, right? Because you don't know what you don't know, right? If you're in part of a community, you're part of that community. You're just, you're just living. You're just living it. And then all of a sudden, you know, my, my skin color was a problem. So there was the racial inequality. 
Uh, my hair was a problem that came with that as well. It used to be longer, by the way. Well, for you all to know. That's also a very long story. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. That's I just knew it used to be longer. Not another day. <laughs> uh, not another day. Uh, but then, you know, so there was the racial inequality, there was the social inequality because I came from nothing. And the kids at my school had a lot more than I did. And then also the gender inequality because all of a sudden, it became apparent that the reason why I had not gone to school in my village was because I was born a girl. And we prioritized the boys more than the girls because we think that the boys would do better than the girls. And so, but it was a very confusing moment. And then I clung on to one big hope. I said, it just doesn't matter because you're going to go back to your village where everyone is equal and everything will be the same. So what happened when you went back to the village and you thought everything was equal? Everything was the same, except nothing was equal anymore. Because in the eyes of my community, my own family, I was no longer their equal. And it was confusing because there I was in school. I was not equal to the kids in school. And they saw me as the girl who went to the city. And all of a sudden, again, it reinforced this idea that you know, so from the penny dropping at the age of 10, being in school and knowing this girl worked for the United Nations and me thinking, that's what I want to do. I want to uplift others. It became clear that the first people I had to uplift were the people in my own community, my own family. And it just reinforced that. And I thought, I felt so guilty. I felt really, really guilty because then, you know, I wasn't better than my own family. How could I be better than my own family? I it's, needed to belong somewhere. Yeah, so in one part of your life, you're feeling the inequality of less. And in another part of your life, privilege. you're feeling privilege. Way too much privilege. That's really confusing. Very confusing. And you're very, very young at this point, right? It's 10 years old. So not, I don't typically do this, but I want to read you something. So now that you know a little bit about Elizabeth's background, this girl from the countryside, I'm going to read you her bio. <laughs> Elizabeth is senior advisor to the United Nations Under Secretary General and global head of the UN's He for She Initiative, a global solidarity movement which engages men and boys as advocates for gender equality. A strong advocate for women's rights and economic empowerment, Elizabeth has worked at the forefront of Africa's development agenda for more than two decades in both public and private sector. She's held positions with UNAIDS, World Health Organization, World Bank. Prior to, the UN, prior to UN Women, she was Director of External Affairs and Policy, Africa, and part of the Corporate Strategy Office at Merck. She was born in Zimbabwe, studied at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and get this, the girl from the countryside completed executive education at Harvard Business School. So anything you want to do can actually happen. So what does it mean to be the UN undersecretary advisor, that whole big fancy title? Tell us what that really means every day when you show up to work. Perhaps the most privilege that I've had all my life because my job, literally, I wake up every morning, I walk into this office with this incredible team of feminists that are, and both male and female, uh, who are just passionate about trying to make sure that every single girl, every single woman in every single country has the same access to equal opportunities. So that's our global mandate. We are the go-to people for gender equality around the world. And so that means making sure, you know, from women economic empowerment, starting with young girls being in school, young girls like myself, once upon a time, uh, making sure again that there's equal pay uh, in the workplace, making sure that we're, we're ending violence against women and girls, which impacts one in three, making sure that we are advocating for more women to be, to be in politics and form policies that shape all our lives. So that's really the mandate and that's what my job entails. Uh, but then of course I had a radical idea in 2014 that something else was missing. So I woke up this morning and in my news feed was the new Corn and Ferry study. Um, did you see that this morning? It was just announced this morning. And it's super interesting because they studied the top 5,000 companies as we all do, or as we see from McKinsey and others of what's happening with gender equality. And what they found was um, still very alarming statistics on female to male CEOs so in their study of 5,000, it was 
one female CEO to 19 male CEOs. I thought we were making progress, but I guess we're not. And interestingly, and this is not to, to say anybody's doing a bad job, but interestingly, they took all of the female CEOs against and the statistics of the male CEOs in the studies, and the women, com the women run companies came out with a 20% incremental price of their stock momentum over 24 months, not at a point in time, but over 24 months of their leadership. So this is a really interesting moment in time of women who are not getting these opportunities very early in careers. It's not that women are just not getting CEO jobs. It's very early in careers to nurture and cultivate women to become eligible and experienced to be a CEO. Um, the CEOs who are out there are doing a damn good job. Yes, but here's the thing. There's a huge perception gap in terms of how men and women view this issue. Right? Harvard did a study and they found on average that actually men felt that women were being treated equally in the workplace, which was, I mean, I think two-thirds of men felt that way compared to one-third of women who felt the other way. Um, even in terms of trying to prioritize gender as a business priority, again, about 84% of women said, yes, this has to be a priority. Only 48% of men thought it was a priority. So there is a perception gap that actually has to be closed in order for us to actually work together collectively. Okay, so... So perception gap for sure has to be closed. It's also education gap, right? Of, well, like, maybe this isn't exactly right, but my 17-year-old son, he, he doesn't even get why I speak for women. He's like, I don't get it. Like, everybody is equal. Like, the women and the girls in my school, like, they've kind of got they've got it dialed in. You know, he's growing up in a world, at, he hasn't been in the real world yet, but he's growing up at least in a school environment where he doesn't even understand this issue and has to be educated on the fact that there is a pay gap, that there, is a, there, there are issues. So with that being said, the he for she movement is really grounded on the fact to leverage the power of the men who support this mission. And you've been able to not only convince these men, many don't need to be convinced because they already believe, um, but these companies to do things they've never done before to help support the initiative. Can you tell us a couple stories? I know you've done some work with McKinsey, you've done some work with PwC, wh whatever companies you think are good to tell us about so that we can really understand some of the action that's going on that's going to make a difference. Yeah, so if I can maybe ground this back to why he for she was created and how it was created. Great. So again, you know a bit about my story growing, growing up in a small village. When I was six years old though, so I grew up through a revolution. Um, Zimbabwe was trying to liberate itself from British rule. My grandmother, like most of the women in the community were freedom fighters trying to liberate our country. And it was a very painful process. And eventually when I was six years old in 1980, Zimbabwe finally got independence from British. And it was a very painful process because how were we going to heal after everything else that had happened in our country? We had, our land had been taken away from us. Uh, we had been denigrated. We had been made to feel lesser than in our own country. And it was, you know, we could either make or break this moment and we chose to go back to our ancient African philosophy of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu means I am because we are and because we are, you are. And it really recognizes how we are all connected as humanity and this idea that a person is only a person through other persons. So if you understand this, I understand that my humanity is intertwined with yours. And so when I denigrate you, I denigrate myself, right? And so this is really the, the biggest philosophy that has shaped my own life and my own thinking and it emphasizes the need for solidarity. So he for she was created based on this idea of African philosopher of Ubuntu. So it meant, again, making sure that as we were engaging this man, it was on the basis of solidarity, 
but then with solidarity also means action. So you can't just simply say, I stand with you. You actually have to also follow up with the actions. So to answer your question, we have created this global movement, which is engaging men in communities. But one of the opportunities that we also saw was, how do we make sure that those men in positions of power actually do something? Right. And we created this impact initiative where it was really grounded on the idea that you have to identify three game-changing commitments you have to reach parity on one of those commitments by 2020. It has to be measurable, trackable. You have to report annually. And so we have worked with some, some phenomenal companies. Uh, quickly, McKinsey is one of the companies. And one of the biggest commitments that we were trying to get from McKinsey was transparency. It's a company that has you know, really built a brand on this idea that- What is it, a 100-year legacy or maybe longer than that yes. for McKinsey? Yes. And, and the economic imperative of women is something that they preach all the time. But interestingly enough, prior to he for she, McKinsey had never publicly released their data. Nobody knew what the McKinsey internal looked like. And this was one of our requirements. And it wasn't an easy thing. It took a lot of negotiation with the legal teams that were there to clarify. But right? then. But then, Ellen McKinsey, no, you can't do this unless you do this. But, but then we released the data. But I, do, I don't want to take ownership because it was really the CEO, the male champion right. who understood. That's right. Yeah. That this is what it meant to be here for she. You can't just say I'm here for she. You actually have to follow up with action. And they released their data. It's not the greatest data, but that's the first step, right? Transparency. You can't fix a problem unless you know how big the problem is. And now they have a commitment to try and, and fill those gaps. Well, it is very impressive, um, McKinsey in general, being able to step up and do this. It speaks to their humanity and what they believe in as a company, as a brand. And the fact is that you can't solve a problem if you can't see it. And so now we can see it. What else has happened for the commitments? These are really strong commitments. Yes, so I will pivot to a country. So Malawi is one of the impact champions. There's a whole big issue with child marriage. In fact, worldwide, every three seconds, a young girl is married, right? This is a global statistic. In Malawi, the statistics were equally as high, and the country made a commitment to end child marriage. And within 15 months of making that commitment, the government actually outlawed child marriage, which was a huge win, because when you think about it, only five states in the U.S. have outlawed child marriage. In the rest of the states here in the U.S., you can marry a child as young as 10 years old and nothing will happen to you. Uh, so it's also important to really show this is not a them versus us, and this yeah. is also happening here. But then for me, the biggest success story that we've seen in Malawi is what happens beyond that. Because once you have the law, the community themselves get really engaged. And we saw male chiefs start to work with female chiefs, the very same men that were marrying these young girls. And in 12 months, they were able to collectively annul more than 20,000 child marriages. And those girls are now back in school. So Elizabeth, behind that is culture, yes. right? You can say anything is the law, but if the human beings don't believe, then other things happen. So what's the backstory to that? How did the people who were actually doing the marriages now go on the side of this is not something we're going to do anymore. What happened with the culture of the country? So it, it's both the culture, but we also know that culture takes a long time, right, to change and even corporate. I mean, the real reason why it's difficult to push gender inequalities, you've got to change the culture. You know, you can't just do unconscious bias and think that everything is going to be fine. The biggest thing I think that happened, without taking too much credit as young women, but we know that the creation of he for she sort of became a catalytic moment. It invited men, because we also always assume that men know that this is an issue for them, and that's a wrong assumption. Men, most of the men didn't know that this was an issue for them, and I think the number one thing by creating a movement and saying, men, this is your movement. You are part of this conversation. But guess what? We also need you to take action. I think that open invitation, that inclusive invitation, was really important to catalyze change. So I'm going to just pause on that for a second. I think that's a huge highlight. And we talk a lot about, as we work towards gender equality, the behavior that we need to see from men. 
But I gotta, I'm going to tell you a really quick story. It's actually kind of embarrassing for me and, and, and behavior I needed to change. I was sponsoring a women's group at another company, and we had one of our first meetings, and the room was packed, and we were ready to go. We had our agenda, and we had things we wanted to accomplish, and I was proud and happy to be there. And there was 100% women in the room. And one of the um, guys, my head of product, came in. He came in a few minutes late. You should never do that, by the way. But he came in a few minutes late. And so I said, and I'm not going to say his name, because some of you people know him. Um, <laughs> I said, I'm going to call him John. I said, well, welcome, John. I'm so glad that you came. And I meant it authentically. But you know what John did five minutes later? He sulked out of that room. And when I looked for him later, I was like, where'd John go? So I went to find him after, and I said, John, I was really happy you came to the meeting. You know, you didn't send the right message that you left. And he said, Elisa, you made me feel so unwelcome. I was so uncomfortable there as the only guy, and you called me out like I was some, you know, different species. And so it was a huge learning moment for me of, of course, I wanted the room filled with men, but it's us who have to welcome and encourage and make it comfortable for both men and women to participate. So thank you for saying that because I think that's a really important part of us getting this work done. You have to create the space. I mean, one of the other champions is Barclays, very male dominated banking. The he for sure commitment was to close the gap in senior leadership, right? And automatically, most of you, you know that this becomes, oh no, zero sum game, more women means I'm going to lose as a guy. And of course, guys then disengage. Yeah. And one of the first things that Backless did was to create what's called he for she male allies group. Um, male allies. Male uh. allies group and created a space for guys to come together, just like women have been coming together in women networks right. all this time within companies and have that moment and space reflect on what, what are the things that they have to do to be part of the change. But then the next step to this was actually opening up the Backless Women Network and making them gender networks so that men were part of the conversation. That's even better, yeah. You actually have to have the conversation to create common understanding, to fill that perception gap that I was talking, talking to you about uh, earlier on, and actually collectively come up with a solution. And it's been quite, quite fantastic. I mean, we now have, you know, almost every Backless country office now has a male allies group. And because of this, men coming together, they also realized actually that they needed something else. Yeah. They needed paid parental leave. And guess what? It doesn't just benefit women. It also benefits uh, men. It also benefits women because then if it's it, shared responsibility at exactly. home, women can also do better in the workplace. So we're going to open it up for questions in a couple of minutes. But one of the questions that I'm going to ask as behalf of, a, of, a, um, of an employee would be, so you've seen so much of this happen and you just describe what happened at Barclays, but do you have any like specific advice for the employee resource groups? So there's a women's group at Namely, there's a Hispanic group, there's a, you know, a number of different employee resource groups. How would you advise them to open that network that way? What would be some of the behaviors or things that they would do that would actually invite that participation and not be awkward or not viewed well. Yes, so I think it is important to safeguard those spaces where we can come together as a group, right, individual groups, because there are some issues that, you know, maybe are not relatable to you. So the idea is not to take away, uh, especially in the beginning, take away from the individual groups because you need those. But at the same time, you need to start to look at how can you maybe still maintain your silo groups, but then maybe once a month or once a quarter, you are coming together as the entire organization because there's a lot of, all these issues are very cross-cutting, right? I know that, you know, the, as an individual, there's so many layers to us, right? I'm a woman, but I'm also a woman of color, and I'm also a woman of color, but I'm also a woman, you know, just, there are all these other layers, but we are not able to actually we, we, we can't progress unless we come together and we understand 
all these nuances of who we are as an organization, not our silo groups, so that we can collectively come up with, with, with ideas to solve some of those issues. So that's my number one thing. Open up at least once a month, or at the very least, take the time to invite individuals from other groups to join your group once in a while, so that they can also, because half of empathy is created by understanding your pain, and sharing our, our pain, and if we don't have the space for dialogue, we never get there. So thank you for that. We're here and we're celebrating what you've been able to accomplish. And we've talked about, um, you know, from the countryside girl to who you are today. But nobody changes the world without being criticized. And, and that's kind of, you know, you try to talk yourself into the thick skin as you do things that are big and meaningful because people do, you do put yourself in a position where you're criticized and it can be really, really hard. Um, what has been the criticisms that you've had to deal with and how have you overcome them as a person in what you're trying to accomplish? So first of all, you have to embrace vulnerability. You cannot do this work without allowing yourself to be vulnerable because then if you're not vulnerable, you close yourself in, you don't take risk, and then you can't actually progress. The biggest pushback happened before the launch of He For She. It came from every angle. Where traditional feminists were said, we need men away from this. This has nothing to do with them. This is our movement and we need them out. And then we had people who were sort of moderate and said, well, I mean, I can see the need for men, but to be honest with you, men actually don't care. They will never join something like this because men like to control women. They cannot give up their power and they like the way things are. And then there were some people who sort of said, well, yes, maybe they could. I just don't think that they will. I don't think they're interested in this. So there was a whole big pushback before we launched it for she to the extent that even within internally within my own organization, I was now having very tough discussions with management saying, this is just too innovative. We are not there yet. You need to let this thing down. But we took a leap of faith. Wow. We launched it for she and the men came, came through. Yeah, and they do have a website, obviously, and if you go there, you'll see really just an astounding community of people, men and women, who support the initiative. That'll be my last question, and then room team, think of questions you want to ask Elizabeth. Well, I don't know if we're passing a mic or how we'll do it, but we'll definitely open it up. And my last question is the kind of the signature question I always ask at our Speaker Mind events, and this one is just so important to us, is what can we do, Elizabeth? So, you know, you're, <laughs> you give examples of countries and huge companies that are making change happen. But when we wake up tomorrow morning and we're reflecting on this conversation with you, which, what can we do as individuals to support and be engaged in he for she? So change begins with all of us. We, we all have to actually get engaged for change to happen. And in my culture, there's a saying that if you think you're too small to make a difference, try spending a night in a room with a mosquito, right? Then you understand <laughs> that you are never too small to make a difference. And so that's also the, you know, that's really my big takeaway and my message to all of us is to say, you know, if a once malnourished African girl can sit here in front of you today, having been able to make a small contribution to our world, you can certainly make a difference. But again, change begins with micro steps. It's very, very, it can be overwhelming, right? When you hear that it's going to take more than 170 years to achieve gender equality, of course it's overwhelming. You think, what am I gonna do? I'm not gonna be here in 170 years. But when you think about it from sort of everyday action, number one, let's just start with people who are parents here. Are you modeling gender equality in your home? Because that's where it really begins with a young girl being told not to play with, with the truck and just play with the dolls and you know, the boy being put in a box of very right. confining masculinity, don't cry, don't show emotions, you know, and they learn to be aggressive as a result of that. But then everyday action, if you're in a relationship, just chores, are they equal? Are you contributing equally? In the workplace, the number, the biggest thing is data. So 
we have to actually as individual because it's never it's never the people that are in positions of power that are comfortable that create change revolutions are built by people they also they are not built on consensus so it's up to us as individuals within companies to question everything what is our data what is the gender the gender data um, and once you have the data then it's no longer an opinion right you have facts and you can start to have a conversation with management and you can start to create change. Uh, but again, I think just even everyday things, that I'll give a very small antidote that there was a study done again that showed that just generally speaking, when it comes to the workplace, women retain the same sort of traditional roles at home. If there's an office party, it's the women buying the flowers, buying the cakes, cleaning up. If you're in a meeting room, again, look around the table. How many women are in that room? If there's not enough women, that needs to change. Uh, if there's enough women, but who's taking the notes? If it's only the women not taking, then you as a guy, you should also say something, right? So I think it's just really being mindful of your everyday actions, your own unconscious bias as well in terms of who you think is suitable for what role. And I think that's how change happens. So in true Elizabeth style, I asked you for one thing that we could do tomorrow. And I think you gave us 17, which, which is fine. We took notes. The men and the women all took notes on their phones and we'll get this stuff done. So I'd like to open it up for questions and uh, comments to Elizabeth directly. Who'd like to be first? Looks like Michelle has a mic to hand you, Larry. For being here tonight, we, we welcome it. Um, so here's my question for you. Um, I am a 58 year old white man of arguable privilege. I'm a CEO, I have two daughters. And I'd like to think that in my life, I have done an acceptable job, but that's not for me to decide, of advocating for women. What fascinates me are these times, maybe in the last two or three years, where my own children, who are now in their late 20s, have challenged me in ways that showed me that I truly did have elements of unconscious bias. And so as I've been listening to you through the evening, the question I have for you is, what, what is it in the psyche and the emotion and the way in which men either do or don't think about this in a way that advances the cause. But then more importantly, what have you learned about how to motivate men to, to step up and take it on? Because I'm always, I'm always kind of frustrated with my own kind of inability to answer that question for myself, which you shouldn't do anyway, that turns into ego. I just want, I just want to raise my self-awareness and then obviously in turn help other men do the same. So what advice would you give us for how to do that and how to wake us up in the right place and the right time to, to carry that forward. So I'll give you already a task because there's, there's a gap in the market. And the gap in the market is that young boys are looking for role models. There just isn't enough male role models. In fact, there was a study that was done by one of our impact champions, Stony Brook University. And they asked young boys to identify who their role model was. 95% of the boys say they didn't have one. Five, out of the 5% who did, 3% said it was Obama. <laughs> Only 2% said it was their father. Mm. And then I thought, this is a US problem. And I went to uh, Finland, because the president is also here for she. And I visited two homes. Again, they have these homes for young kids that have been off the streets, that have been taken in. And as part of the healing process, they created these empowerment walls. And on these walls, they are supposed to put the people that they aspire to be. And the girl wall was completely full. Everyone from Malala to Hillary Clinton to, you know, all the iconic people that you can think of. Then the boys' dorm, there was nothing on the wall. And I said to the boys, how come, how come there's nothing on the wall? And, and they said, the one little boy finally put up his hand and said, well, at some point, I thought it was David Beckham, and then I thought about it, and I thought, well, he doesn't really represent who I am, right? And so, no, no but it's really important because we talk a lot about the need for role models for young girls because if you can't be it unless you see it, right? And so, the number one thing is, what can you do? You can be a role model. What does it mean to be a role model is you actually have to take action. 
the way that we've been able to motivate men on he for she was not to tell them what to do. So the other criticism that I faced in launching he for she was that I decided not to be prescriptive, which mm -hmm. is the opposite of what the UN says. The UN says, you do this, you do this, you do this. And they said, you need to tell men what to do. And I said, no, I'm not going to tell men what to do because I don't want to take their agency to come up with ideas on what they can do. And sure enough, we saw men start husband schools. A man in my country, Zimbabwe, he literally went around his village, handpicking all the men that were abusive to their wives and started a husband school underneath a tree. So all this to say, what we've done with you for she, how we motivate men is we take this example and say, look what Sam did in Zimbabwe. You can do the same thing. And so what I would urge you to do is to look within your company. Are you gender equal? If you're not gender equal, just pick one thing. Don't try and do everything, because it can be over. Pick one thing that you say, as a company, we are going to do this. We are going to achieve this by this date. You've got to put a timeline. You've got to put a, a delivery. And then once that's implemented, you are documenting the proven practice, which is what we are doing with he for she And you can then use that to inspire other CEOs and, and become a role model for the world. Because we need, I think, enough of the talk. We know what the problems are. We need solutions. Thank you, Larry. Great question. Who's, who's next? This team didn't get shy in the last few months. What happened? <laughs> Hi. So I'm very curious about uh, implicit bias in the hiring process and then the employee evaluation process. I, I'm coming from a nonprofit world where it is extremely female dominated. I'd say about 90% of the frontline staff is female, and yet in the CEO's office, it's at best 50%, but that's at best. And yet you see a lot of the qualities that the female employees are lifted up for are in, you know, she always puts everybody else first, she's a good team player, right? Like all of these exceedingly feminine qualities are what's elevated, and when you are a woman who doesn't exhibit those things, that you're penalized. And I'd love to hear about how we can look at uh, your ideas around implicit bias and more holistic employee evaluation and hiring. Yes, so actually, even in terms of, that's also an interesting point because even in terms of women evaluating themselves, studies have been done over and over again that we tend to be actually quite critical about what, what we think we are worth. You know, a woman would look at a job description with 12 requirements, she would, have, she would have 11 of those, and she would go, ah, almost did it, almost had it, but I can't apply because I'm missing the one thing. And the opposite for men, they'll look at everything and say, I only have one of those things, but I'm sure I can figure out the rest. <laughs> and, and, and so, and it, it, it continues. Even when you self-evaluate at the end of the year, we tend to score ourselves much less. So I think that actually requires sort of cultural change. I think sensitization of the qualities that we are looking for, because also, we know that those feminine qualities, right, as they are called, are also really important, yeah. you know, and they need to be valued as such. But at the same time, we also need to make sure, because one of the things that um, even, um, you know, Melinda Guest was talking about is that as women, we're almost afraid to exhibit another type of leadership, right? Because then if we exhibit a leadership that isn't, perceived as feminine, then perhaps we are not, you know, we are not for gender equality. So I, I think we may also, and, and we're always trying to put ourselves in a box. I would add that this, it's not binary. And I think we actually need to create new forms of leadership and, and show young girls, you know, or those coming up within the chain that it's okay, you can be feminine, but you can also be respectable. Uh, and it's not a binary uh, conversation. But also, Elisa, you would know this, right? Well, I, what are some I'm, of the I'm challenges? Sadly, or reflect, I don't know if it's sad, but I'm sitting thinking of all of these stories as you're giving this advice of being the only woman in the room or having that observation or, you know, the, others, the other part of you shows that's not labeled feminine might be aggressive or might be bossy or, you know, I mean, just give the list of adjectives and you feel that, yeah, I'm going to be penalized for that. <laughs> I don't know if my penalty is coming tonight or if it's coming next month, but I know it's coming. And so it, it 
unfortunately sort of leads you to adapt what might be your natural style to be somewhat more acceptable. And that gets to your question as well. Not an easy question. Larry's question wasn't easy either, but your, your question is tough and one that's going to take a lot of time to work through. That being said, individuals make a difference and the people making those hiring decisions and doing those screenings, it's so important. They're trained. And this concept of, oh, I'm not qualified. Um, it's, it's actually a piece of advice I give women. Go apply for a job you're not qualified for and see if you can get the interview. Just see if you can get it. Worry about the interview once you get it. But instead of saying, I, I can't go do that, say, I wonder if I could get that meeting. Get the meeting. Then worry about the next step because you kind of build your confidence as you do that and break it down. We have time for maybe two more questions if we have them in the room. But, but also the more gender equal the workplace is, the less it is going to be challenging to try and have all these balances because if we're just all equal, then yeah. we're all equal. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's really inspirational. It's, thank you for that. I'm going to ask you somewhat of a personal question. So speaking of role models, um, what were the women in your life that you knew personally that inspired you and gave you that confidence to go forward in this world? Thank mm. you. <laughs> I'm going to focus on one because there's been quite a lot, but the, one of my biggest role models is the woman I work for right now. Okay. Her name is Pumzil Mlambonguka. She's the executive director of UN Women, and she is a former freedom fighter from South Africa. She was in the anti-apartheid movement alongside Nelson Mandela, which is how she got into politics, and he ended up appointing her on, a, on his cabinet. But also through his mentorship, she ended up becoming the first woman to be deputy president of South Africa. And so to work with her is an incredible honor, because even when we're, you know, when we're getting this pushback from internally, her as a leader, again, having been through the Ubuntu sort of era within South Africa, her and I, we understood the same thing. We understood that solidarity was critical, and she had my back all the way and said, we will do this, because we know it fundamentally to be true and to be correct, that at the end of the day, no matter what our differences are, what we share is much more powerful than what divides us and we need men to be part of the conversation. So I would say she's one of my biggest role models. Do we have a final question for Elizabeth? Great. Just wait for the mic so the folks on the webcast can hear. I was almost waiting for that question. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Right on time. Thank no, you. It comes up all the time and it really breaks my heart mm -hmm. because people always say to me, Elizabeth, it's so great that we have he for she, but more than he for she, we need she for she. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, I feel quite sad about that because it means as women, we are not doing as, as much as we should be for the younger generation. It's usually the younger generation that's asking for this. And they say some of my most biggest critiques are my female uh, bosses than male bosses. And so I think, again, the reason why it also breaks my heart because at the same time we are trying to promote this idea of sisterhood because we actually need to be able to stand together and support each other especially when we are still not getting the support that we need from men. Um, so again, I don't have an answer for you. I, all I can say is that I feel your pain. I hear this all the time. And I can only make a call to action for the women who are here who are supervising. Just be mindful because we can be so harsh on, on ourselves uh, as in you know, women. And, and half the time, in fact, young girls tell me, 
I work with a boy and he doesn't get the same treatment as I do. So I know that sometimes in our need for tough love to make sure again, you know, sometimes it's come from a good place, right? Because, because they see themselves in you and they want to support you and they want you to, they want you to thrive because they know also that the world is not equal. The things that you're always going to have to work a bit harder than the guys. But at the same time, I think we need to be mindful of that because we, we are also breaking young girls when we fail to uplift them. So again, you know, please let's be she for she. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good answer. It's another tough question. And if I could just add 20 seconds to it. I have to say for me, myself, my literal life changed when I found a women's group I could really relate to of women who had similar um, challenges in life, but were diverse in terms of where they came from and who they were and have a place where you can actually talk and support each other. And this group has become a group that literally only prides itself on helping each other excel. And so I would just say, hang out with those people and find those people and make that group bigger and bigger and bigger. And it will make a difference for you and it will make a difference for you and it will make a difference from the, for the new woman who you invite to join the next week and the week after that. Because I think at the, at least from my perspective, I guess we're telling ages here tonight. I'm gonna be 53 next month. And I will tell you, early in my career, I really didn't see a lot of women supporting women. I see so much more of it now, but I also think I'm seeking it more and I'm participating more. And so that would just be my little add to that. So Elizabeth, in your TED talk, you quote Albert Einstein, and I wrote this quote down because I think it's kind of amazing that Albert Einstein said this. If women and men are part of a greater whole, it's not our gender that defines us. I can't read my own writing. It's not our gender that defines us, but, but it's our shared humanity. Why don't you give us a final comment about shared humanity, and then we'll give you a huge thank you for joining us. So I think it comes back to, so Einstein says something else before this. This is actually my quote, which, which again stems back, stems from the Ubuntu philosophy that at the end of the day, instead of spending time looking for the things that separate us and how different we are, more so now than ever with the current climate when everything feels so polarized, the only hope that we have is we, if we start to focus on the things that unite us, the things that we share that are much more powerful than the things that divide us. So that's really my thing that at the end of the day, it's about humanity. We are all part of the one human family and it's up to us to uplift all of us. And so I don't know a better way to end tonight and to also mark this milestone, for those of you who are new to Speaker Mind, welcome and so glad you participated. For those who you are not new to Speaker Mind, you might know that this is our anniversary. This is our first year anniversary of in the inception of this program, the idea for this program, which was, you know, just an idea in the air, um, just a little bit more than a year ago. And we've now, how many events have we executed team six, seven, eight. I, I like that counting. Betsy's counting. Great. Um, you know, eight events with some remarkable guest speakers, contributors, both men and women. Um, but honestly, I don't think there could be a better topper than having you tonight at our first year anniversary, Elizabeth. Thank you for coming so very much. And in true Speaker Mind style, for those of you who are here at the event, it's cocktail time. Thank you for joining. Bye.